Uh, to, we're going to go to the book of Luke. Let me get here to my notes this morning. Amen. We've been learning about New Testament characters, and I'm excited for this morning. We're going to go a couple places. We're going to be, uh, well, you know what? Forgive me. Let's start in Genesis. We're going to start in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, I apologize. We're just going to start right right at the very beginning. I'm going to get into this. We're going to read this. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 13. Verse number 13. And the Bible says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is, it, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. We've been learning about New Testament characters in Sunday school, different people in the Bible, uh, the Bible. And I know we're in the Old Testament right now, but we'll come to the New Testament. But I wanted to start with somebody that's mentioned in the New Testament and, uh, and work our way over, uh, or somebody that's mentioned in the New Testament that's also in the Old Testament and work our way uh, back to the New Testament to see. But I, I want to uh, show you a little bit about, and without giving too much glory, we're going to look at this New Testament character that's found all the way through the Bible, and that's the devil. We're going to learn a little bit about the devil this morning. I'd like to, I believe that, uh, I believe that it's of vital importance that just as we take time to study the heroes in the Bible and those who have accomplished great things for God, I believe that we must also study our adversary to know what we're up against. A lot of times we, we know too little about the devil, and that hinders us as Christians. Because we don't understand enough. Now, we don't need to... Well, a, a, a good statement that I heard from a, a great general in the army, he said this. He said, you shouldn't underestimate an enemy, but it is just as fatal to overestimate him. Amen. So we don't give too much attention. Amen. We don't overestimate, but it's just as fatal to underestimate. And a lot of times as Christians, especially in churches in America, there's not enough... Uh, to inform us of what the devil is trying to do in our homes. And therefore, I believe that the devil has snuck in behind our backs because we are not aware. We must be careful as Christians that we do not take our adversary lightly. Yes, we have been given the ultimate victory over the devil, but I believe that he can still win the victory in, a, in the small day-to-day -day battles of our lives because of a lack of knowledge. So during this time, I think I want to, I'd like to take us through some verses that will help us understand his purpose and objective and how we can have the victory over the old smutty face. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Bless the Sunday school hour. May we learn something this morning, Lord. May you uh, help us, God, to learn from the word of God, Lord. As I prayed last night and even this morning, God, would you please bless and help us, Lord, and, and Lord, to become more aware, Lord, of what we need to take care of and how we, Lord, can prepare against the devil, Lord, and, and fight, Lord, for our homes, fight for our country, fight for our families. Lord, I pray that you'd bless it this morning, and we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start in the book of Genesis because I, I always start and, as, as, and act as if um, that nobody is aware of who the devil is. I know that many of us have been in church and many of us know who the devil is, but we're going to start at the beginning just to give us some verses and to help us understand who the devil is this morning. We saw in Genesis chapter 3, verse 13 here, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and we find somebody called the serpent. The serpent. Let me take you over to the book of Revelations. Say, how is the, the serpent the devil? Well, we're going to go to the book of Revelations chapter 12. If you'll go there. Chapter 12, verse number 9. The Bible gives the devil a couple different names that when you look through the Word of God, you can look for these names and you will find that they refer to the devil. Roman, uh, Revelations 12, 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we find four names that are referenced through the Bible that refer to the devil. We have the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Now, not every time the, the name the devil is used, it's also used for the devils. The Bible talks about the devil and his angels and the devils that, uh, that uh, possessed men in the New Testament as well and, and, and different things like that. But 
Uh, when it's capitalized like that, the devil, you know it's referring to the figure of Satan. But we see that here he was in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.13. This is when he is first mentioned in the Bible. When you start from the book of Genesis and you read, this is the very first mention of the devil in the Bible. We know that the devil is uh, part of the reason for the fall of man. He, the devil tempted Eve and she fell for the lies that he put before her. And Adam followed uh, and followed right behind her. He starts out by questioning the word of God. So you can get a basic idea of what the devil is doing. He starts out when we first meet him questioning the word of God. He says, yea, hath God said. And that's what he's done ever since. The devil is going to do nothing more than try to make people question God. That's what the devil's after. Now, a lot of times we, uh, we just think, well, uh, you know, when uh, he just is you know, uh, here just to make us all unhappy and make us all sad and things like that. But anything that you do in this life that makes you question God, the devil's behind. Anything you do that will make you question God or God's faithfulness, the devil is behind because that's his objective. Notice when we meet the devil, we don't even, uh, in the very beginning of the Bible, when he comes into play, he's not even known as the devil. It's just the serpent. The devil disguises himself. We don't even come across, if you're not familiar with your Bible, you wouldn't even know who this was. Because the devil is doing, the devil, that's his objective. He wants to question God, but he doesn't want to do it to where you realize it's him. He does it in a way where you don't even know he's coming. Isn't that true in America? Boy, the devil's come through the back door in our country and made our country question God and question the Lord. And people don't even realize it's the devil's face behind the mask. Amen. We must be careful how much we learn even from the very beginning when the devil appears on the scene. Now, we go over to, you can go to Isaiah 14, 12. This is the only time that this specific name is mentioned for the devil. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. And many are familiar with this name, but this is the only time it is mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nation? This is the devil's name before he fell, Lucifer. This is who he was in heaven. He was an angel with God. He was a perfect angel. He was a beautiful angel, the Bible talks about. In the, you can write this verse down, Ezekiel 28, 13. talks about uh, he was a, a, an anointed cherub, and it shows his power and his influence over the angels. He, was, he had power... God had given him power over the angels. God had given him a place uh, of influence over the angels. This Lucifer that we're familiar with. And, and let me tell you, stay away from these movies, uh, this new movie that talks about Lucifer. That's a bunch of nonsense, okay? We don't glorify the devil, amen? Hollywood does, but that's because the devil's behind Hollywood, amen? Stay away from that kind of stuff, amen? Lu he's out to... Uh, uh, confuse the world, and, and I believe he does that through these movies and, and, and the exorcist and all this stuff. Stay away from that, amen, because that's just there. That's by the devil, amen. That doesn't glorify God. And this is a name for the devil, Lucifer, and we understand who he is from the beginning before he was cast out of heaven. But he was an anointed cherub. He had influence. This explains why in Revelations it says that he, uh, was, he drew a third part of the heaven with him, a third of the angels followed him, but it was because of his power and his influence that he had. He was also a minister of music. We believe that he was even over the music in heaven because the Bible talks about how that he had, uh, got, that it says that God prepared his pipes. It talks about music and how that the devil uh, controlled some of that. Be careful what music you listen to. The devil controls music. Amen. The music that's anti-God is pro the devil. Amen? That's part of the devil's plan. I believe that the devil works through music, and I believe that he knows the power of music because of what he did in heaven for the Lord. He knows what praises God. He was there in the beginning. He was the one that orchestrated. He's the one that wrote it to praise God. So I believe just as the devil knows what will glorify God, I believe the devil knows what will not glorify God. 
And the devil has controlled the music of this world to not glorify God. But just as the devil is, uh, has music that is completely anti-God, I believe that the devil by disguise comes to Christians with music that's close but not there. A lot of times we have those things where we go, well, is it good or is it not? This is what I believe. If you have a question, don't listen to it. If you even question, my, uh, my parents used to tell me, when in doubt, don't. Amen. If you can say, I wonder, then don't do it. Don't listen to it. Amen. Because the devil wants to disguise himself to sneak his way into your home and make you think, well, it's, it, it, it's almost okay. It's got Jesus in it. Amen. But that's the devil again. Amen. Just like he did to Eve. He came not as himself, but as a disguise. I believe that most of us know, amen, that Christian rock isn't good, but a lot of Christians, you'd be surprised, they think it's okay. Well, it's Christian rock. No, amen. Just because you put the name Jesus into it doesn't make it right. That's what the devil does, amen. So be careful what you allow in your home. The devil's out for a dis and the devil's out for our families. And a lot of times we avoid the subject, but God says don't give the devil an advantage in the New Testament. So we must be careful not to give him the advantage in our home. I believe that there are even Christian artists that sound close, but their lives do not glorify the Savior. Really, they are nothing more than the devil's advocates, and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. Amen. But the devil uses them. So we must be careful. Now, we go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9. Now we're in the New Testament. And I'd like to give you uh, some, a, defi a, a definition to give us an understanding of the devil's purpose. Revelation 12, 9 gives us four names for the devil. These four names mean four different things. And I believe that these four things can help us understand the different objectives and the, and, and the purposes that the devil has. I believe that's why God gave us these in Revelation 12, 9. Number one, uh, we're going to uh, start with the name the devil. Matt, this is the most common name. Matthew uh, 13, 39 uh, uses this name as well. Uh, the definition for this name means prone to slander, slanderous, accusing falsely, false accuser. The devil is a false accuser. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Amen. The devil is out to accuse, just as he did Job, the Bible says. And in Matthew 13, 39, and I'll read that for you, talks about uh, the same thing, how that the devil is out not to uh, edify, not to glorify, not to find out what's good, but he accuses. That means he looks for fault. That means he try to, tries to find the wrong. Matthew 13, 39. Uh, the Bible says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So we see how that the devil is mentioned in the New Testament, this name, the devil. And he is the accuser of the brethren. It talks about in Hebrews as well. And basically he is out to, when he goes before God and goes with your name, he's out to accuse you. Amen. And he's out to try to find the fault. A lot of times though as Christians, we don't realize the devil uses us to be an accuser of the brethren. Amen. When we always look for fault. Amen. That's what the devil does. We must be careful. Uh, so we have that name, the devil. Then uh, we have the name, the serpent, in there in Genesis 12, 9. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. The serpent is cunning. A serpent or a snake is crafty, smart. In, in, uh, in, in the book of Proverbs, in, in different places, it talks about how that the serpent uh, being wise as a serpent. John 3, uh, well, not that verse yet. Uh, uh, in Ephesians, it talks about how that when we put on the armor of God, we're to be careful because of the wiles of the devil. How that the devil makes a plan. How that the devil carefully and craftily thinks about what he's doing. Amen. John 3, 14. Uh, and I'll show you something here. A good thing to remember. John chapter 3, verse number 14. 
says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I believe that the devil compares himself to a serpent because Jesus is compared to a serpent. The Bible says that when Moses in the wilderness lifted up the serpent so the children of Israel that were bit by the snakes that God had sent, they were going to die. And Moses lifted up a serpent and God said, If they'll look to it in faith, they can be healed. And that represents the Son of God and how that we can look to Jesus and be saved. Well, the devil is nothing more than a copycat. Everything God creates, the devil will imitate. You can, remind, you can mark it down. Everything God creates, the devil will imitate. God has a church. The devil has a false church. God has music. The devil has false music. God has a Bible. The devil has false Bibles. Every, God, everything that God has done... The devil tries to imitate because the devil cannot create. The devil does not have that power. So what he does is he uses what God has given and turns around and, cre and imitates what God has created. Amen. A lot of times we, uh, we think the devil has his own means, but really the devil just uses what's given to him by God and therefore we underestimate the adversary. John 3.14, there is a good reference to know that how Jesus will set free, but the devil will ensnare. Jesus is, the serpent, is compared to a serpent here that was raised up in the wilderness to set people free. The devil is compared to a serpent that will ensnare and bite and poison. Amen. The next name here uh, Romans, uh, or from Revelation 12.9 talks about the name Satan. Romans 12, 9 talks about this name. We're going to go here. The devil is also called Satan in the Bible. This is very familiar as well. Romans 12, 9. The Bible says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And that is the wrong verse. <laughs> but let me see here. If I typed out the wrong number here. What did I do with it? That's right. We'll go to a... Uh, let me see here. I wrote down the wrong one. I'll get you the right verse. But anyway, but we know this name is used through the New Testament, the name Satan. The name Satan means adversary. The name means one who opposes another in purpose or act. So we see the devil is an accuser. The devil is a serpent. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's smart. A lot of times we just think he's, a, he's this dumb figure that walks around with horns and a pitchfork. Amen. But the devil is actually a smart character. Now, he's not wise because wisdom is the fear of the Lord. But he is smart. Wisdom chooses God. Foolishness chooses the opposite. I believe the devil is foolish, but he's a smart fool. And we must be careful. But the name Satan itself means an adversary. The devil is also an enemy. He opposes God in purpose and act. So you can mark this down. Anything that opposes God is under the control of Satan. Anything that opposes God and God's church, God's word, and God's people is under the control of Satan. I'm talking about the wrong music like we've mentioned. I'm talking about abortion. I'm talking about uh, Hollywood. I'm talking about atheists. I'm talking about the LGBT movement or atheism, excuse me, uh, and then false religions, all of those things. Anything that is anti-God is in control of the devil. Amen. Now, the people can be saved, but the movements, the institutions, all of these things, witchcraft, all of those things are under the control and guidance of Satan because he is God's adversary. But not only is he God's adversary, he's the Christian's adversary. 1 Peter 5, 8 talks about that, and you know that verse, but you can write it down, how that he is the adversary. Amen. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is also the Christian's adversary. 
And so he is out to get us as well. This, Satan is your enemy, not your friend. That means that anything Satan does is out to destroy you, not help you. So anything, if we're not careful, that we allow into our homes that is under the control of Satan will, is, is out to destroy us and our families, not help us. Amen. So we must be careful. So we know that the devil is an accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. He goes before God constantly and tries to bring up your sin to God and tries to accuse you, tries to do all of those things, as we know from the book of Job. He's also a serpent. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's un, he uh, is in disguise. He's also an adversary. He's a, he is an enemy. But then the last name here is a dragon. A dragon is nothing more than a great serpent. Revelations 20 verse 2 talks about the dragon and talks about how that he is cast into, the, into punishment, into everlasting fire and things of that nature, but he's compared to a dragon to define his power. We have to remember that he's given liberty from God to control this world. John 16, 11 uh, talks about, and I'll turn there to show you what I mean. John 16, verse 11 says, let me get here, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is the devil. God has given him authority. That's why he is the prince of this world. He's given the devil the authority for now to control this world. Amen. The devil is behind the movement. And we'll see one day where he'll gather the world to fight Jesus when he returns. He's given some authority right now. And that's why we must be careful to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because they are controlled for the time being by the prince of this world. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 is another verse. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says, Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The devil is given the power of the air. Notice that he's always a prince. And that's because he's, God is the king. Amen. God has given him some power, but God ultimately controls it. That's why we can pray and ask God, and God can turn the tide. But the, God has given the devil the authority right now. Amen. But when a Christian prays, and on his behalf, God can intervene. Amen. And ultimately control the heart of the king. But the devil's given the, the power of the air. He is the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Amen. So he's given that liberty, given that power. Another verse here real quick, Mark chapter 3, verse number 22. Mark 3, verse 22. It says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem uh, said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. The devil is given a name here called Beelzebub. This name is still in reference to and just means, this name simply means Lord of the house, is what this name means. Beelzebub just means Lord of the house. And then, in the, and then in the remainder of the verse it says, and by the prince of the devils. All, it, all it's referencing to is how that the devil is the prince of the devils. He's in control of what goes on. He is the Lord of that house, the Bible says. He is over all of the devils, himself and controls where they go and what they do. The devil is not omnipresent, which means he cannot be in more than one place at one time like God can, but he can control who goes where and make sure that his influence is everywhere. And that's how the devil works. The devil obviously is not here in with is not here or not uh, uh, also in across the country or at the same time he's in one place. But he controls all of the devils, and he controls everything that goes on to make sure that his influence is known. That's what we must be careful for. Amen. He, so he is, 
He is referred to as also Beelzebub, which just simply means Lord of the house. But again, what it's, what it's showing is how that God calls him a great dragon because it shows his power and his influence that he has over the earth at this time. Amen. So, uh, we see who is the devil. Number two, we're going to talk about the work of the devil. Um, and just some verses you can write down. Job 1.6, Revelations 12.10. Talk about uh, he is the accuser of the brethren. Luke twenty two thirty one talks about how that uh, he will sift the Christian. First Chronicles twenty one one and Acts five three talk about that he will provoke you or push you to do wrong. First Thessalonians two eighteen Satan will hinder you, and Luke four two the devil will tempt you. These are, these are all verses that just show us throughout the Bible different times that the devil has done something in what he's done and shows us what he is trying to do in our lives. Uh, and Luke twenty two thirty one talks about how that Peter, Jesus said, Peter, but I have prayed for thee, says, because the devil hath desired thee that he may sift you as the wheat. The devil wants to sift Christians. He wants to put Christians through the fire. He wants to, he wants to sift us to get us to fall away from God. The devil is out to, out to hurt you not out to help you. The devil is out to sift your families. The devil is out to take you and try to destroy your life for Christ, ultimately destroying your influence. Then in 1 Chronicles 21.1, it talks about how that he provoked David to number Israel. In Acts 5.3, he filled the heart of Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the Holy Spirit. The devil may not be able to possess you, amen, praise God, but the devil can provoke you. It means the devil can push you to do something you know you shouldn't do. The devil can push you to go against God. That's what he did to, that's what he did to David. That's what he did to Ananias and Sapphira. The devil can uh, fill your heart and your mind with thoughts that are anti-God. You ever wonder when you're walking around thinking and then all of a sudden you go, man, where'd that thought come from? The devil can do that. The devil can put things in your way that will trigger you to think and act against God. Because the devil knows what makes you tick. He's been around since the beginning of time, and he'll be around long after. But he's been around humans since we've been... He's been around man since we were first created. I think he knows what makes us tick. And he knows what buttons to push you. And he'll do it. Because he wants to provoke you to do wrong. Because by doing that, like David, he influences your decision that causes many maybe to die, many to fall, and many to make wrong decisions. By provoking you to do wrong, he affects your family. By provoking you to do wrong, he affects your church. By provoking you to do wrong, he affects your country. And that's what we must be careful. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 talks about how that Paul said, I would come to you, talking to the Thessalonians, it says, but Satan hath hindered us. The devil want, knows that maybe he can't stop you from doing right, but he will try to hinder the work that you have to do. I believe the devil's done that this morning, amen, with some rain. That hinders some people from coming to church. It takes, it takes, a, it takes about 20 gallons to baptize you and three drops to keep you out. <laughs> But the devil does that because he wants to hinder people. The devil hinders us from doing right. The devil hinders us from giving the gospel. The devil hinders us from doing what God wants us to do. I know a man that he's a pastor this morning, and his father was called to be a pastor but never surrendered. And he told his son, he said, Son... He said, I knew God called me and I did not answer. He said, and I regret it to this day. He said, but the devil hindered me. Be careful because you may think that you're above, but the devil will hinder your work for God. And the devil will do that. But he'll use things to get in your way to hinder you. This is why a Christian must be prayed up. This is why a Christian must be in the Word of God. Because only God can help us to foresee the evil and hide ourselves. Only God can help us to be prudent and to forsake that evil and foresee it and hide ourselves 
Otherwise, we are as the simple one that goes on and we're punished. Luke chapter 4, verse 2 is another verse that talks about how the devil will tempt you. The devil does tempt. The devil does put things in your way to tempt you to do wrong. He tries to hinder your doing for right and tempt you to do wrong. But a lot of times the devil is an excuse saying, well, the devil tempted me, that's why I fell. I mean, we, we hinder ourselves more than I believe the devil does. But the devil will tempt you. The devil will put people in your way to cause you to turn aside. I know many of pastors that are not pastors this morning because of temptations from the devil. Because of not putting up our guard, thinking that we are above temptation causes us to fall. Pride goeth before a fall. Amen. The devil will tempt you. Fall, uh, dad, the devil will tempt you. Husband, the devil will tempt you. Wife, the devil will tempt you. Mom, the devil will tempt you. Children, the devil will tempt you. The devil's out to get you, and he will put that wrong before you. Now, what is our defense against such a foe? Well, if you are saved, may I remind you, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Now we turn this around to talk about how that Jesus Christ lives in us, and we have the power. You have been given by God through Jesus Christ the power to overcome. When you got saved, amen, you are now on a different road. And the devil will try to hinder your walk for Christ. Now you of yourself have no power. If you try to fight the devil, you're in big trouble. It's kind of like uh, the other day me and DJ, I put him in a headlock. Oh. Now, by himself, there wasn't nothing he could do. Because I got... <coughs> uh, by himself, not a whole lot he could do. Now, when he says, Dad! <laughs> then I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> I'm here, and Brother Donald is... Here. <laughs> then I'm going to say, oh, oh, okay, yeah. Because I know I can take DJ, but I don't think I can take his dad. <laughs> well, you know, the devil knows if he can just fight you, he knows he can take you. But when you get on your knees and you say, Dad, then the devil knows he's got to back off because he can't stand against God. A lot of times as Christians, we try to fight the devil. Come on, I got you. And then we end up flat on our backs. Because by ourselves, we don't have the power. But that's why the Bible says, greater is he that is in you. Not greater is you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now that's just not referring also to the devil. That talks about anybody in the world. But the devil as well. Then the Bible says, that we have the sword of the Spirit in Luke 4, 8. The sword of the Spirit is our defense to fight off the old devil. God is in us, and God has given us the victory through Jesus Christ. Jesus also is the Word. And so God has given us the Word of God to fight the devil. This is why it's important to constantly be in your Bible. A lack, of Bible, a lack of a diet of the Word of God will produce a weak Christian to be able to fight. Memorize the Word of God. Put it in your mind. Put it wherever the devil tries to get. Amen. All of us have different weak points. The devil knows that. Some of us are stronger in areas than others. So you find out your weakest link and you strengthen it. Some of us have, some of us have problems with thoughts. It means you put the Bible in your mind. Amen. God's Word in your mind to strengthen that area of your life. Some of us have problems maybe with our hands. Amen. Get the Word of God. Carry it around with you. Amen. Use the sword of the Spirit. Amen. That's what God's given it to you for. It's the only weapon of offense that you have to fight the devil. But it is so lightly used. Many Christians go into battle and forget a sword and forget their sword 
and you go into the day, you go in to fight the devil during the day, and we wonder why we lose. Amen. Get in the Word of God. James 4, 7 says, Submit to God and draw nigh to Him. Resist the devil and he will flee. How do we get the devil to flee? You draw nigh to God. Many of us go and we go where the devil's at. We're arm in arm with him. Amen. God says draw nigh to where God's at. The devil's not going to want to hang around God. The devil's not going to want to hang around church where God's honored and glorified. That's why a lot of people say, you know, uh, well, I, don't, uh, I, I, I can worship God at home. I tell them, say, the devil's not going to come here, but he'll go to your house, I'll bet you. He'll be with you while you're worshiping God at home on the television. But God is here. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. The devil's not going to hang around where God's at. That's why it's important to bring ourselves to church, bring our children to church, bring our families to church, to get away from the devil and get around God for a while. That's why it's important to pray and get a hold of God in the morning. The devil's not going to hang around whenever you draw nigh to God. Amen. Draw nigh to God. But also it talks about how we have to submit to God. There are a lot of people that are in church but are not submitted to God and open a door for the devil. Be submissive. Be yielding. Be humble. Amen. The devil will flee. Uh, a good statement by a great man of God said, The devil will never use a humble person. The devil can't use a humble person. If you stay humble, the devil can't do anything. Amen. But draw nigh to God. Get around God. Get God in your home. Read your Bible. Spend time in prayer. Amen. And then last, in Revelations 12, 11, it says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Victory is only given to those who are under the blood. Amen. And the word of their testimony. Amen. Your salvation, your getting saved, being born again, is the key to overcoming the devil. Because a lost person can pick up a Bible, but it has no power to them. The power comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And yes, God's Word has power, but God's Word cannot give them the victory that we have as Christians. Amen. We can use God's Word, and it can fight the devil, and it can affect us. Amen. So we must use it. Now, the principle is to remember that we have a battle to fight, and the devil is our foe. And he is not to be underestimated. But however, to remember that we have the victory through Christ. Amen. But to remember this. God has given you the victory over the devil. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, I'll show this to you. Many of you might be familiar with this. But this is the thing to remember. Here's how to keep you humble. A lot of times we say, uh, like the disciples here, we get a little prideful. God says, Notwithstanding, Jesus said, I'm sorry, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. Amen. So the joy should come not because the devil's underneath you, although I'm glad for that, but the joy comes in knowing that our names are written in heaven. We're saved and we're born again. Because of that, we've been given victory. But the joy is not to stand around and be like, ha, 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 we've been given the victory over the devils. We can conquer. We can go forth. God says, come back over here and just say, thank God my name's written in heaven. Amen. Because the world's not going to want to look at somebody being prideful and saying, yeah, I've been given victory. The world's going to want to see somebody who says, hey, I'm just born again. Amen. I'm saved. The disciples were wandering around giving glory, saying how that they could cast out devils in God's name and given all of this power from God. But I believe that when Jesus saw the disciples rejoicing over power, I believe that Jesus in his mind went back to when the devil said that I will be like the Most High. I will ascend. And Jesus remembered the day 
that the devil rebelled because of pride and how that his father cast him out of heaven. And I believe that every time we as Christians get glory over power God's given to us, it reminds Jesus of what the devil did and how that pride will cause us to fall. We must be careful just to rejoice that we're saved, but not neglect the power given to us to have the victory. And then the last principle we need to remember, the Bible says not to give the devil the advantage. I believe Christians give the devil the advantage by letting the devil in when, it's dis when he's disguised. I think we need to take a self-inspection of our homes and of our families to think about according to God's Word, what are some things that maybe are used by the devil? What could the devil use to get the advantage in our homes? Talk about in the military and then we'll be done. When you're in the military, the idea is to get the advantage over the enemy. Whether that's to gain some ground, whether that's to send in a spy, whether it's to do whatever you can. But the idea is to get the advantage so that you can conquer. The devil in your life is after the advantage. He wants to get the one up on you. I don't know if anybody's a ping pong player in here, but I love ping pong. Anybody ever played ping pong? You tie, what do they call that? You deuce, you know, you get to the end, 20 and 20, you deuce. And then somebody gets the one up, what do they call that? The advantage. You've got the advantage, why? You're one up. You're one step closer. Well, the devil's playing you, and he wants to get the advantage. Don't give the devil one up on you. Don't give the devil a one up in your home. Don't give the devil one up on your children. Say, how do I do that? Be careful what you watch. Because what you're doing is on that old TV, when we're not careful, we're giving the devil the advantage. may not affect us, but it affects our children. Now, ultimately, I believe it affects us. We think, well, I, I, it doesn't affect me. Yeah, it does. And you're giving the devil advantage over yourself and over those little ones. When you stay home from church, you're giving the devil the advantage. You're giving him the one up. So we must be careful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the Sunday school lesson. Lord, may we remember, Lord, and not underestimate, God, how that the devil is after our homes and our families. Lord, may we constantly be on guard. But, Lord, may we remember that we have joy and victory because of our salvation. Lord, what a blessing that it is to be saved. Pray that you bless the morning service. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you just bless all that we do and say for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. We'll be back in five minutes.